Thank you so much. Um, welcome, colleagues, to this to this final panel conversation. And I'd like to think about it as where the rubber hits the road conversation. Um, uh, it's a long time since we've had such deep and at the same time sweeping conversations about equity in higher education. Um, it's been super exciting and i really like to thank um, Shamit and Ian and the entire team at Access for putting on um, such a wonderful event um, for us. Um, we've talked about um, funding um, a few times over these past two days. Um, and it's really, we've, we've you know, heard from a lot of people that a lot is possible um, in terms of the Accord Roadmap if it is funded. So this is really the, you know, like um, the, the pointy end, this is a conversation about um, priorities. Um, we've got a glimpse in the budget last Tuesday um, where some of the additional money is going to go into setting up the ATEC, into reducing hex indexation, um, the payment for prax and some of the courses, new, new uni-ready places, um, demand-driven funding for equity group students in addition to First Nations students, a doubling of the university study hubs in the regions and the suburbs. So these are some of the indications that we've had. But there are also question marks and gaps. The most um, significant uh, question mark for our conversation is uh, needs-based funding and what this is going to look like. Um, the biggest gap is the inaction on income support. We're going to traverse this terrain in the next hour um, and we have a very illustrious, uh, illustrious panel to take you through it. It's potentially um, the most technical panel that we're going to have, so strap yourselves in. You know, this is a post-lunch session. Um, for some really interesting contributions. I'll really uh, briefly introduce the panel. Um, many of them don't need any introductions, but I'll, I'll indulge, you know, like you anyway. Um, but please do submit your questions via Slido. You know, we'd make this as interactive a session as we can be, as the previous ones have been. Um, so please don't hold back on your, on your questions. Um, and I am, I am <coughs> wonderful in doing this. I have not introduced myself, so my name is Nadine Zacharias. Um, I lead a, a small consulting company called Equity by Design. I'm also in 2024 a visiting scholar um, with Access um, doing a project where we're trying to look at um, the supporting outcomes in the, in the Sahif and starting, starting to spell these out. Um, to my left is Associate Professor Gwilym Krocha, um, who is the Deputy Director of the Centre for the Study in Higher Education at the University of Melbourne. Um, Gwil is a former Fulbright Scholar. His research focuses on different aspects of the political economy of higher education, and he's published widely on higher education policy and management, and also a regular media commentator. Welcome, Gwil. Um, um, and I have Andrew Norton in, as the next. Andrew Norton is a professor um, in the practice of higher education policy at the Australian National University Centre for Social Research and Methods. Um, he was previously the higher education program <coughs> director at the Grattan Institute. Um, Andrew is widely published, um, including as a um, co-author um, on higher education topics. He's mapping Australian higher education um, uh, report, uh, the most recent one for 2023 is an overview of higher education policy and trends. And of course, Andrew was also the co-author um, on the Kemp Norton Review um, of the demand-driven student funding system and um, a member of the ministerial reference group of the University Accord. Um, Professor Trish Davidson um, joined the University of Wollongong as Vice Chancellor in May 2021. Prior to that role, Professor Davidson was the Dean of the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing um, in Baltimore um, in the United States. In 2021, she was the recipient of the Consortium of Universities for Global Health Distinguished Leader Awards, um, which captures and celebrates her exceptional contributions to the advancement of global health work worldwide. And finally, our host, um, Professor um, Shamit Saga, um, who's the Executive D Director of Access, also a visiting um, professor at King's College London and Emeritus Professor at the University of Access. Um, Shamit has worked um, you know, across many decades of experience in international academia, government, business, regulation and philanthropy, including as a former senior advisor um, to UK Prime Minister Tony Blair. So welcome to this amazing panel. Um, the way we're going to run this is um, our four panelists are going to um, provide a brief provocation um, or in Gwil's um, case, a bit of a, a history of funding of higher education and then we'll open up to a Q&A from the floor. Over to you, Gwil. Thank you, Nadine. Um, 
I've been fortunate enough to be able to have written a couple of histories of Australian higher education and I mean I think we can say uh, at its core, at their core, universities are their students. And if those students are not succeeding, then it's very hard to argue that the institutions are succeeding. <coughs> what I'm going to talk about now very briefly, and I have promised the Dean that I'm going to be quite quick, is just to go through some of, uh, just a couple of points on the funding in the last 30 years, as a bit of a way to, to frame some of the conversation that we're going to have um, from here on. So, uh, in terms of the dedicated equity funding going back to 1989, we've had a number of different um, schemes. Okay, we've had the Higher Education Equity Program, the HEAP, the Aboriginal Participation Fund that finished in uh, 1992. We've had th that was replaced eventually by the Indigenous Support Fund. We've had the Disability Support Program. Um, we've got the regional loading that came in there. There's uh, HEAP, which everybody is familiar with, and uh, obviously most recently it's been a lot of it's been rolled into the Indigenous Regional uh, Low SES Attainment Fund. Now. The key point I want to get to with this is just looking at what proportion uh, of funding these uh, dedicated uh, equity support funds have meant. So back in 1989, um, if you just look at the core educational funding for teaching um, and roll all this dedicated funding together, it was about 1% of that core funding. If you include full funding, so that's the student contributions as well, it was about 0.7%. Um, by 1996, we had a low point. Uh, at that stage, it was about 0.1%, right? Dropped that far. Uh, and even lower, obviously, if you add in student contributions. Now, we had a high, well, we had a bit of an increase uh, and return in 2007. It was back up to 1.4%, uh, and then 0.7%. And then we reached the high point. And this is, I think, something we might all reflect on. In 2013, um, it was about 4.5% of core educational funding um, was for dedicated equity programs. But this is, this is part of where the rub is, and we'll start to, to get into this. Uh, at this stage, student contributions had increased significantly. So if you look at the total amount that was um, funded for teaching and learning, it never reached the 4% aspiration that Nadine referenced in Bradley the other day. Now, if we look roughly, and this is back of the envelope, if we look at the moment uh, and look at the recent announcements, we're probably somewhere around 4% of that core funding. But really, because student contributions are such a significant element in funding for higher education now, it's probably only about 2.6%. Right? So these are just the core named uh, equity support programs. Now, just a couple of takeaways. I know Andrew and other colleagues here are going to talk a bit, a bit more about where we're at now. But... Um, it's, I think one thing that's helpful to recognise is that prior to 2010, these were largely loadings, right? and that's what we'll be discussing today. After 2010, we have a mix of loadings and also dedicated programs for particular interventions uh, and initiatives, which we're all sort of familiar with. Now, there have been a number of critiques of both this sort of retrospective funding uh, and sort of prospective funding, you could almost call it. You know, retrospective funding um, broadly... Uh, because it just represents where, where, where enrolments are and can potentially stifle innovation, okay? It can concentrate um, these funds in particular institutions, right, and does not necessarily uh, well track changing uh, student profiles. Uh, and equally, if, uh, for funding that is uh, for particular initiatives, uh, you know, as we have discussed at length in the last two days, there is a real challenge in knowing what works and what's concentrating it. Uh, so they're just a couple of uh, points about the history of the funding and I just want to turn now before I uh, hand over to Andrew just to talk a bit about uh, income support and some of the uh, numbers there in terms of youth allowance. Because uh, I think this is, uh, when we're thinking about funding and we're thinking about where we, we uh, want to focus uh, and prioritise, because at the end of the day, part of the discussion we'll all be having here is that it is, it is a zero-sum game. We have a limited amount of funds, uh, and thinking about how they uh, are directed is probably key to um, some of the discussion we'll have this afternoon. But uh, in terms of youth allowance, about a decade ago, youth allowance was about $240 a week um, for the 18-year-old out-of-home rate. 
That is now about $327 a week. As we know, that is basically below the poverty level. Um, we, we talked about that yesterday. If you, and I'm dead, uh, uh, based on some of Andrew's work, so thank you, Andrew. If we, uh, if we look at what the, the mean uh, income for employed students was, right, so that's working students, that's about $700 a week, which I think most people would agree is probably closer to what you would need to uh, live any sort of life that isn't extreme poverty as a student. It's almost impossible just to survive strictly on the youth allowance rate. So, what does that mean? Well, if we're thinking uh, about the amount of money that would require to um, bridge the gap there uh, and bring it up to closer to that $700 amount um, for youth allowance, we're probably talking somewhere in the order of $1 billion to $1.5 billion a year alone. Equally, and this is the point that I'll end on, if we're, we're thinking about um, the aspiration to increase some of the dedicated funding, and I'll just focus here on HEP uh, and the base funding review. So the base funding review argued that um, really the minimum level of HEP should be about $1,000 per student for, and this is just for um, you know, funding you know, those students that are in the low SES category, um, and that's about a 7% of core funding. If we are to extrapolate that and look at what that would look like today as a sort of a bare minimum, um, we're probably talking about $1,400. Um, so that's in the order of about $250 million we would need just to meet that 7% for low SES students. And of course, I'm not considering all the other loadings that we would, um, you know, that, that the government's announced that we, we'll talk and discuss about today. Um, over the forward estimates, it's about a billion dollars. So you can already see, uh, and I'll end it here, that we're starting to, we've got quite large um, requests on the budget, and there's probably some pretty hard discussions we have to have about how best to use the available funds. But I'll hand to Andrew. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Chris. So I think one of the big issues we're facing here is whether programs like ELSAF or HEP will actually continue or whether the, all the equity funding will really be absorbed in the major funding programs, Commonwealth Grant Scheme, Student Income Support, and the Help the Loan System. So I want to talk about what's going to be the structure of the student funding system under the Accord. So what the government has said is that there are essentially going to be a system of what they call managed growth. Uh, each university will get uh, a target range uh, expressed in FCLs, or full-time equivalent terms, Presumably with some background calculation about how that is going to contribute towards the overall participation and attainment targets. Where it gets complex is that uh, over the last week, the, the government has continued to use the phrase demand-driven funding for equity students. And really, demand-driven funding and managed growth are conceptually two different kinds of systems. So it's really unclear what demand-driven means. Even sort of just yesterday, they were sort of trying to avoid this competitive environment, such as the old demand-driven system, where some universities aggressively expanded, potentially at the cost of other institutions. I think what they're trying to get at is that there will be capacity in the system uh, to meet all plausible demand from equity students, but this won't actually be, from a university point of view, a demand-driven system. That is, you can expand as much as you like as long as they are equity students. <clears throat> so this is going to need a lot of clarity uh, for the sector to work out what are the implications of this. The other big change, which I think is probably more radical, looking at the history of the system, is this idea of needs-based funding. So the current Commonwealth Grant Scheme and associated student contributions uh, is entirely based on the discipline, with the assumption that you know, different forms of teaching and other aspects of that drive differences in costs. And I think probably the idea in the accord that I like the most is the idea that there are other characteristics we take into account in teaching funding, which is where you probably replace some of the HEP kind of uh, factors. But the question is, how do you design this system, this needs-based funding system? And I guess... At the moment, what they are saying is that it will apply to low socioeconomic status, so that's people from the bottom 25% of statistical area ones across Australia, 
uh, students with a disability and Indigenous students, and a separate uh, loading for regional campuses. So one interesting aspect of this is that one of the major equity groups, regional students, is not actually there other than potentially the regional campus loading or in the overlap with low SES. Now, this could mean we've got a different funding system for needs-based versus demand-driven uh, funding, which is a bit complex. But I actually agree with taking regional students out, and I'd also take low SES out. And the reason for that is that we all know that low SES is not a particularly good proxy for low SES. So the bottom 25% is not a particularly good proxy for low SES in the first place. And it's certainly not a good proxy for actual needs. So what I would say is that we should have a range <coughs> of needs-based characteristics. For the academic needs, I think we can use uh, metrics such as school results, whether you've come in via vocational pathway, enabling pathway, uh, prior higher education. Like there's already a lot of research, which Ian Lee and others have done, which looks at you know, success <coughs> rates based on your kind of entry uh, pathway. And for something like ATAR, so it is true that low SES students are overrepresented in the lower ATARs and therefore would more likely to get needs-based funding. But if you look at, say, the 60 and below ATAR range, which I would class based on attrition as being a vulnerable group, uh, about 70% of those students do not meet the current low SES uh, definition. So should we ignore their needs just because the ABS has classified their home location in a different way? I don't think so. Then if you look at, say, the 80-plus uh, ATAR group, who I'd say have low academic needs, no more than just any other student might need through their, through their course, about 12% of those students, based on 21 data, are, are low SES. They probably don't need much help. So I really think that we should use this much closer measure of underlying academic needs. And for this, we should just keep using the FSOR measure that we use for... Um, um, for other, uh, other uh, funding systems. One thing that has come out, I think Alec from RUN is not here today, but uh, use of university services. So they've shown that their students, uh, their part-time students in particular, have quite heavy use of university services, even though their FSOR might be low because they're part-time students. I think a problem with this is that we don't have any existing national metrics of the services that are available and how often they are used by different types of students. So we're starting from a low base there, possibly something that ATEC uh, could do. But I would suggest probably using some proxies like part-time students uh, to start with. Might be getting picking up by proxy on the kinds of students who are likely to make heavy use of these services. Then we've got disability support. Now, this is an area where there's been quite minimal funding historically within the higher education system, certainly absolutely no relationship to the actual needs uh, of the population. I think this is a complex one because obviously uh, what supports are needed is going to vary significantly according to the actual type of disability. And also there could be high capital costs for some of this even if the actual student numbers are fairly low. So I think that's a complex one. I think probably eventually you'll end up at some kind of headcount measure, but there probably should be some program to deal with the capital costs of getting the, uh, the university facilities up to the level where the, the students with disability can use them. And then finally, Indigenous support or Indigenous civic services, probably there I think a straight headcount measure uh, is probably going to be the easiest way to fund that, not EFSOL. So thank you, Nuno. Um, I'll, I'll take chair privileges and yeah. ask a clarifying question. So yeah. if you said we take low SES students out, you know, of the individual support, would you then address financial disadvantage and financial hardship through income support? Yes, yeah, so basically this is trying to directly target yeah. demonstrated need. Yeah. Centrelink is a monster, but, you know, they mm -hmm. do, you know, their job is to try and measure the, the actual resources that you have got and pay money to those who... Yeah who meet their criteria. Yep. Yep. And again, so what we see is actually the latest census or the table builder version of it has a whole lot of DSS and ATO uh, data integrated into it. So what it shows is that where the parental income test applies, yep. 
it's doing a really good job of targeting youth allowance to the bottom 25%. Mm -hmm. um, but once you get the, the age of independence, youth allowance rate is basically flat across all 10 SES yeah. debt aisles. So yeah. it, is, it is good at alleviating your financial <coughs> problems, but it's not a targeted program if you're concerned about low SES. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that makes a lot of sense. And we have said that for a long time, right? Yeah. We have had the conversation, what is different now 15 years post-Bradley? You know, like what we know now and potentially knew then is that scholarships are not going to fix this, right? So like scholarships are too small scale. Like correct. I've got, I've got no correct. objection to universities correct. offering yeah. them, but ultimately it's the student income support system that has to yeah. do all heavy lifting, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So it has to be consumed. Oh, thank you for that, Andrew. Um, Trish, over to you. Okay. Well, um, firstly... Congratulations um, to ACES. This has been a really great meeting and I've learned a lot and had the opportunity to reflect. Um, I'm going to make some more overarching comments, deferring to my learner colleagues who really have the domain um, expertise in costing, but maybe just give some more macro things for us to think about. I think the big thing is, um, as we look at, uh, and I've re actually reflected on my MED that I did in 1982 in educational policy and thinking, boy, you know, we haven't actually done a lot of evaluation of policy, that's what I learned. But just to think fundamentally, it is a very different world to the Bradley Report 15 years ago. I think, um, you know, the global pandemic uh, has really represented you know, not only was it cataclysmic in the world and defining, we're really, the, we're in a different world. Climate change, geopolitical um, conflict and economic factors are really altering the world. And I think we can't think about Australian educational policy unless we think about what is the more global um, situation. And I guess we've talked minimally about migration and the impact on this across the whole sector over the last few days, but moves towards nationalism and populism across the world are, you know, are impacting on um, countries' appetite to be taking international students. So I really think we have to think about also a bigger um, macroeconomic uh, factors. The other thing that I think is going to be really important if we're going to get this right in funding is definitions of terms and clarity in nomenclature. I've been really impacted over the last few days of um, maybe how this equity framework or equity groups is not enabling and how we transcend to more a resilience-based framework. I also think from my University of Wollongong experiences, like if we look at just categorisation, say, of SES, students who are in Bega in the southern New South Wales have very different needs to students in Liverpool who may necessarily just be categorised the same. I think some of the clinical placement funding may augment that, but I think the practicalities are... are real and any sort of scholar here who's in diversity will un recognise the importance of considering um, intersectionality and I think that that is got to be really important. Um, I should have mentioned too when we think about this critical moment in universities there is still a lot of scepticism around the value of, of a university education and we can't deny that because in essence, why we're all, many of us are still struggling post-pandemic is that we were denied access to um, funding to support uh, wages and other factors that other industries got. So if you were a private university, you had access to JobKeeper, but not if a public institution. So I don't think we can um, also deny the reality of, um, in some ways, even though we've heard from politicians over the last few days, a very affirmative view um, that many people are, would be sceptical of this equity agenda. So we've got to be very, very careful in the metrics we use. And I think we really need to start linking this to a productivity agenda. We know in Australia our productivity is falling. Why is that? For my learned friends here will have much more erudite um, comments, but I think it's really important to think about that. The other thing that we have to do, and if I can speak of from more a university administrative um, 
uh, role is we have to have much better costing models. I just think about you know, safety on campuses, a safe and respecting communities. Most universities have had to absorb quite a complex infrastructure with minimal funds, which in essence is augmenting deficits in community-based services. So sexual assaults do occur on campuses, but I know from our data and other data I've seen, much of the services that universities are being required to provide are related to uh, community-based events. So I think we really need to get much better at costing. I think about my healthcare background. You know, we know, you know, what, what is it going to cost to actually um, recruit one of these uh, students from a targeted background and what is it going to do, what do we have to do to keep them there? But we have to be able to um, measure attrition. We have to be able to measure students moving across different sectors. Um, also, different world from 15 years ago for Radley. We've seen this in the early office space. Many students had accepted maybe five or six offers going into the beginning of the academic year. Um, the market's going to drive a lot of these behaviours, but you know how do we how do we manage um, for staffing, etc. So, I think um, one of the positive things that would be called was in the early entry space, where it's you know there's consensus about enrolments in the September of the year. But I think we really need to to um, think about that. Um, the other comment that I just did want to make about is the role of technology and AI in helping us make some better decisions. Um, I, reflecting on, say, a lot of the, my US experience where there's been a big move to holistic admissions. Now, it's expensive to do holistic admissions and there are abilities to game the systems in essays and a whole lot of other things, but I think, um, if we look at how people have been able to address some of these factors in other industries, I really think we need to get much better at um, not you know, being able to do much more uh, rigorous, holistic assessment of people who are eligible to universities. And of course, the ATAR is a big industry, um, and I think we can't deny it. And there are many uh, people who will do, um, defend that to the death but many people have been in other parts of the world, um, recognise that, you know, it's just another test. It's just another, another thing. And then the other thing is um, really listening to students, and I so much enjoyed the student, student panel. Um, for example, talking to students, I have not met a student who has not been happy with getting an early entry into university, but I've met many people who are harsh critics. And then my last point about the use of technology and artificial intelligence, and I know some of us are already doing this, of identifying students at risk. I always remember to my, telling my son, you know, Chris, they can tell if you're logging in at 11.55 p.m. on the night the assignment's due to submit. But, you know, that's just a reality. You know, how do we pick up students who have not appeared? I mean, I was really... <coughs> Ooh, disappointed at my university in the ghost student phenomenon that, you know, a lot of students never turned up with international students and I'm thinking, how did that happen? So part of that is, what are the metrics that we use in the classroom? You know, it's hard if you've got a class of 600 students, how do you keep track of those things? So I guess my point is that we need to think of reforms at the macro level at the meso-organisational level of the universities, the structures and workload, and also at the level of the ind individual, if we're really going to achieve this equity agenda. And understanding those key steps and the intersection of those factors within an ecosystem is going to make sure, make sure that smart people like my colleagues can develop funding models that are reliable, valuable, applicable and sustainable. Trish. Shamid, over to you. Um, okay. Um, I can't help but to share the, um, the deadline one. I've got a 22-year-old in London who got her final submission in with 12 seconds to spare. <laughs> That's, of course, a badge of pride. She's going around boasting on the internet about this, but I, I don't know what to think. Okay? <laughs> um, 
And there's an inherent risk, of course, of doing policy in, in universities from a bunch of people who are got, guess what, university-age kids. So, you know, on the one hand, we've got massive studies and surveys, and there's an inherent risk of sort of uh, anecdotalizing. I'm guilty as the next person, by the way. So, look, I, I've lis listened really carefully to um, the panel, and um, I think I pretty much agree with the points that are being made. But it might be worth sort of just sort of stepping back a little bit and then going into the sort of foreground. So the way I look at this is, um, and I'm, apologies, I'm going to use a, um, a metaphor that's going to fall over, but it's a bit, a bit like the Russian doll, isn't it? Yeah? You've got the big Russian doll, which is managed growth, right? and then the doll within that is this thing about demand-driven for particular groups that we've identified, the point that Andrew was talking about. You know? And so that makes me think you've got to, you want to do this and you want to do that. And you want to do it in a kind of coherent way, in an elegant way, so you don't set off all sorts of unintended consequences. And I suspect the chance of that are at least 50%. Hence the kind of notice, Andrew doesn't mind me saying, sort of bit of skepticism about this could easily be designed the wrong way. Right? I think that's probably a fair, fair statement. It could also equally be designed well. So I'm going to concentrate on that side of things. It is actually a challenge of basically targeting. Right? So you've got students in Australian universities in the future, and we have you know, a shared consensus that students from an equity background need additional help. Now, we get into the help that is directly about them in a moment, making sure they get in, they succeed. But there's this other point about, this larger point, remember Jason's point, which is as we double the size of this, we don't want the number from equity backgrounds, whatever percentages, to fall further behind. That leads to the risk that I've always taken very seriously, which is you end up creating this sort of knowledge economy full of people who have got degrees and this sort of skilled, uh, unskilled underclass. And people just fall, fell further behind. That would be the worst possible outcome. They could be going backwards, not forwards. And I think that particularly applies to people, uh, students, future students who are from um, you know, um, uh, difficult socioeconomic circumstances. And that, then that's doubled by all the issues that go with that, which has barely got a look in. Uh, we generally, as social scientists, we call it social capital. Social capital is the problem, essentially, of not knowing anyone goes to university and them not knowing anyone who goes to university. So it becomes extremely uh, unlikely, as it were. And then if you make it onto a university campus, if you ever get through, it's you know, more luck than by design. So all these things are going on in the background. And I just want to focus a little bit upon how Andrew's approached this. Essentially, the targeting question, comma, to do it elegantly. It's really important to get this right because of those risks. So the way I've sort of configured it in my mind, and I think it's, it's basically you know, it's an ATEC point, is it? On the one hand, it's got a year and a half to sort of, um, you know, uh, sorry, a year to get across this. On the other hand, that time will elapse very quickly if we don't sort of get these points right. So Andrew's got into some granular detail about how one is related to the other. I'm a bit more relaxed about that. I, I don't think we need to get quite into that granular detail, so long as as many universities as possible, ideally all of them, but as many as possible are getting consistent signals. So if I have a vice chancellor at a given university in Australia and I've got an agenda for growth and I've got you know, programs coming on or I've got markets, you know, student markets down the road or wherever they are, I must know, I'm, I'm running that university, I must be accountable for that, and I want to be part of this growth, then I have a relationship with ATEC to manage this growth. And ATEC needs to obviously establish the criteria for that. You, know, you can imagine a sensible criteria. You lean into that and you get, off you go. And then I wouldn't personally have the conversation about the, the so-called demand-driven bid separately. I'd actually link the two. You, you, not surprisingly, you, I'm going to say that. I would say that's excellent. Off you go. Grow in the way in which you want to grow. But at the same time, we want to make sure that you don't, your equity participation doesn't fall further behind. It's perfectly possible for universities to say we've got a growth agenda and demand-driven is for equity students is not for us. Or the other way around. You could have all of your growth from so-called equity student backgrounds. So the permutations are all there. I would just be in favor of linking the two in an intelligent way. And so it seems like a very sensible, mature signal to send to a university vice chancellor and their governing body to say, we understand your growth plans. They correspond with our plans for your ma the managed growth in aggregate. And that's really good, a series of you know, ticks in the margin, as it were. And so what are your plans for making sure that the equity component doesn't fall further behind? Demand-driven is just a kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of piece, piece of, you know, it's a policy wonkery. It still, it still, still requires 
We're just simply saying we're not going to cap it, okay, in any, you know, in any, any arbitrary way. You still need to demonstrate that there's demand. Or, or as a vice chancellor, how are you going to stimulate that demand? So what are your plans for growing and including equity? And curiously, it sort of takes us back to the point that Omar was raising, which is that looks like a planned way of doing things. Yeah, you kind of send, oh, that's excellent, and you hold people to account over a three or five year cycle. I won't call it elegant, but I don't think that's inelegant, is the kind of thought that's going through my mind. And the key thing is I'm trying to link the two. Last point, I'll just literally okay. shut up in a second. The, fun, the funding <laughs> thing is all there, I understand that, but we do need to sort of have some distinction in our minds about the sort of pots it's sort of going into. So I, obviously you've got this sort of, um, you know, that's going to funding students to be students. So HEX is the obvious example, and you've got some relief now. In the future, you might have some more relief, or it might get worse. But there's a dedicated liability on the taxpayer to, uh, to underwrite that, all right? Default rates aren't particularly high in, in Australia, but you've just got to be mindful of the fact that's quite a big bill on them, but someone does underwrite that, okay? Treasury takes that sort of mindset. Second point is the actual programs. We can debate the merits of the things that were announced last week, the price tags. The only thing I'd attach to that would be, let's just make sure that they're working. Now, you'd expect the Director of Access to say that, okay? And let's be fairly systematic about it. And by the way, can we actually include them in the sort of planning, the elegant planning that I mentioned? It seems to be a sensible place to put that. And then the last thing is the, the, the really big money, if you think about it, is the almost $11 billion that goes to Commonwealth-supported places. And this is the whole managed growth agenda. So does that double, if we're doubling student numbers? I can't do the maths. But my point is that's a very big lever enjoyed by government. And if you're going to enjoy a, a bigger lever as that, I would be in favour of including and linking the equity component not falling further behind lever within that. I would, try, I would avoid having it as a separate exercise. That, to me, seems like good targeting, concentrating on the big doll and the sort of the smaller doll. Apologies for my metaphor. Thank you for that. Um, Andrew, do you want to respond to Shamit's comments on managed growth? No? no? Okay, I, I'm going to wrap it into a bigger question. Um, so I'm, I'm taking your final point and also that your comment around consistent signals um, and stretching it to um, a conversation we had yesterday um, with, uh, with a panel that had Mary O'Kane on it on how do we incentivize universities and how do we, you know, like bring this down to the local context, you know, like is it, and the reference to Andrew's paper, Andrew Harvey, you know, is it mission-based, is it place-based, is it, you know, like so how do we create um, arrangements between the universities and the Commonwealth in terms of setting out their aspirations for growth, for diversity and so on. Um, does the panel want to reply to that? I'm happy to yep. keep up. Yeah, go on, um, Trish. Leaving aside demand driven for a second, um, I do have some nervousness around loading um, based models. Okay, and part of the challenge is that if those loadings are too low, we do not dedicate enough money. Um, we risk sending weak signals to institutions. Um, we also risk uh, this money being used for purposes that we perhaps don't want it to be used for. Right. One, I think it would be a tragedy if um, a lot of the money that we're talking about today in terms of supporting the broader equity agenda went to solving other um, problems in the funding system. And we do have a real risk there. We don't think carefully about the quantums. Right? And also, if a needs-based funding system comes at the expense of dedicated money for particular interventions, and getting that balance right is going to be very difficult. Um, so it was really interesting you mentioned scale and I, I think of you know the University of Wollongong we have campuses in Liverpool, Mossvale, Nowrabiga, Batemans Bay. Now we're never going to administratively scale to make the, them effective camp, campuses on their you know on their own like we're not going to be saying it's not like opening a campus in Western Sydney and say you know, we can look to 200, 300. So I think we really need to understand what it costs to run those campuses, how can we collaborate better across the sector, how we can leverage digital infrastructure. But I can tell you once, you know, one of the most impactful things that I do in my year is go to those graduations because you see those people who would never have gone to university 
because they've got young kids. They're just, and most of those people end up living in those communities. So I think we also have to think about what is a base level of, of funding. I know in the first iteration of the Accord, there was muting of a regional national university, maybe trying to get at some of that. But I think even some of the um, conversations from the student panel in Western Australia, you know, you could pick those same towns and sizes and realise that you never, you know, this, we've just been pushed into this bigger is better kind of model mm. in Australia. Yeah, fair. Andrew? Like bigger is cheaper is kind of the core thing. Like, we, you know, we do have an economies of scale model which yeah. has been combined with an idea that we should take the education to the students. So in some ways, the regional campus is like having the local schools or the local hospital. It's actually making it easy for people to get there rather than having, say, a UK or US model where there's some expectation you'll move out of home uh, to study. And for me, this is, even though there are obviously benefits in going to these sort of university communities, this has been one of the big things that has kept the cost down in Australia. And for that reason, I, I quite like this model, even though people should be able to move if they want to, obviously. Shami, do you want to have another go at it, or you feel you have no, no, I'll, said your I'll, piece? I'll, I'll lose, lose um, energy. Um, but, but Andrew, again, is touching a point, a, a larger point, which is that we can be content with it because it's kept costs down, but it does mean that you're going to have to be very good in developing good universities and programs in the regions. We can't just sort of say in, in the regions. It could end up being a SOP if you're not careful. Mm. So you want to make sure that your measures, your understanding of evaluation on academic grounds and also on social inclusion grounds are, are robust, you know, because there's, there's a <coughs> hidden risk in all that, that's all. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I do have a few t uh, largely technical questions online, um, but also are there any questions in the room and maybe we, if people raise their hands, we can start to line up the, the microphones. Um, so there are technical questions, particularly around HEP, you know, will HEP continue into next year? If HEP gets replaced, what happens to it? Um, Andrew, do you want to...? Well, HEP is in the forward estimates, Correct. so yep. that's the... Forward estimates are not a legal document, but that's a fairly clear policy signal that will continue. But I would say once the full needs-based funding system is in place, the question is whether they'll raid HEP to support the needs-based funding model. And can I just say that oh. hard-worn experience has shown that what is in the forward estimates is not what happens. <laughs> and HEP has, and I did try and calculate it for this, but I didn't quite get it done, has been one of the areas that has been cut historically over the years. Yeah. It has. Thank you. Um, we have a question over there with Gemma. Dan. Thank you. Uh, Dan Edwards here from the Australian Council for Educational Research. And my question falls very closely with what you were just saying now. Um, and I just see that there's a, there is an issue in thinking about needs-based funding and having, do, do, do we have equity-specific pots of money or, do, or is it all pulled into the one, into the one uh, uh, area? I, I think the latter, I think it should be the latter. And one of the reasons that I, I was saying is that, um, as Will has just said, that the HEP funding and, and its, its predecessors have always been so um, unpredictable year to year and we've, we've, we've heard equity practitioners talk about, well, how do I budget for next year? Because I don't actually know how much money I've got, so I don't know which students I'm going to serve, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I think that the idea of having needs-based funding that pulls all of this money together is very good. But I guess my question back to the panel is around the accountability for that. So I, I think it was Gwil who mentioned the risk of um, robbing Peter to pay Paul for want of a better, a better phrase, um, how do we make sure that that accountability stays there with universities to make sure that the, 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 the things that are needed to support students are in place and are actually being spent that way? And there was a lot of talk about this yesterday. But, um, yeah. yeah. Um, let's go to Andrew first and then others will So have one of the government documents did say they wanted uh, universities to equip for how they spent the, mm -hmm. the needs-based funding. That's an extremely bureaucratic approach, very labour intensive for the universities, all very consistent with their overall kind of audit mistrust approach, but nevertheless very costly. <laughs> um, Looking you know, I would prefer something more like the original TEXA model, 
which has got some indicators about what's going on. And if you see the types of students this money is supposed to help getting bad results, that's clearly a red flag that should be investigated further without forcing every institution to every year send in all these detailed reports on exactly how they spent the money. Well. Yeah, and I suppose building on that, um, there's always going to be a trade-off between sort of autonomy and the ability to innovate, right, and how we quit. And I think um, on balance, uh, we wouldn't want to lose the ability to innovate. And I don't think I need to say that to people in this room or online. Uh, and so maybe that's the price we have to pay, and that's the price we accept, that there will, at some stages, be things that we just can't quite equip. Do you want to chime in? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just... The other thing that just concerns me is we don't have standardised data definitions. So if you're looking at attrition in first year, you know, how do I know, you know, someone enrols in nursing at Wollongong, doesn't like it, and then enrols in teaching in Western Sydney. That sort of stuff happens all the time, but we don't have the means to track that. What if they go to TAFE and do something? So I just think... You know, the metrics is good, but we need robust measurements, standardised data definitions and methods to track it. Mm. And it's not that we can't do it, right? It's just we don't do it. Like, the investment isn't made. It's technically possible. But I, I mean, it's taken as read that there's huge room to improve exactly mm. that. Because mm -mm. this is just making a bad situation worse. So you could easily put together the top ten things that could be fixed. I'd settle for settling, fixing six of them, because they're so egregious, having such big distortions all the time. I just want to go back to the question. Um, so, look, I mean, I, I take an old-fashioned view. If you give money, money often comes with strings attached, right? I don't, can't understand how the federal government's going to come and say, we really understand needs-based funding. We've completely got it. And we understand the additional costs you have. And that's wonderful news. And then we're completely relaxed about what happens next. So whether you take a kind of what is so-called bureaucratic and intrusive measure with a allegedly high regulatory burden, or you take a more outcomes-based measure i.e. modern regulation, there's, there's a debate about how, how you do that, or that you can do that, is a matter for ATEX. Right? It's, going to go down, it's going to come down to them. They could design the worst possible thing, which is show us everything you're doing at every 15-minute interval. That would be wise. Yep. But you want to empower people and say, well, you're on the front line. This is kind of your core business. We well, now got hypothecated funding in place. I'd also give some stability to that and say, essentially, we want to squeeze the maximum positive outcomes according to what you think your equity challenges are, rather than being defined and characterised at a distance from Canberra. So, you know, Nadine, if you're running a university and you've got that, you must know best, certainly better than I would know, and you should take some ownership of that. And that has a lovely symmetry, because then I can come along and hold you to account for that. Yeah. I'm looking but, but for better outcomes. The question to me is, how do we codify this? You know, like, how do we say, these are the outcomes my university is seeking, you know, in, in equity, in whatever outcomes well, we are, but, but and then how do we assess it? It starts with that? taking a more evidential approach. So when you sit down and write this plan, mm. you know, letter to ATEC or whatever it is, yeah, you start on the basis of saying, well, we've looked at existing evidence for the particular groups that we're talking about in this particular plan. And this evidence might come from access, it might come from somewhere else. I'm completely relaxed. But we've taken an, ev an evidential approach. And we are quite happy to carry on doing that, and we're quite happy for the Commission to, you know, if this is a kind of virtuous circle. If you go on the basis of saying we want to achieve something, but we won't know if we achieved it unless we ask the question. Hmm. That's called evidence, okay? And people within university are perfectly capable of doing that. Yeah. And I think also it's in, you know, like what did we set out to achieve? You know, like this is the English model and the access and participation plans, right? Like where did we set the bar? You know, where did we want to land and did we get there? And why not? If not, why not, right? Trish, final word, final word on this, and then I'm going to go to yeah. another question. So just on evidence, we need better data collection and we need to foster educational research. It's been positively discouraged in my uh, four decades in the academy. You know, don't, don't do that. It's not counted. You know, outcomes. Go do a NHMRC-funded randomised control trial. And so, lo and behold, in the accord, they say, we've got this data void. So I think as a sector, we have to really um, privilege that form of research because it's going to guide us in the future. I don't, I don't want to hog it, but Patricia's right. It's more serious than that. So the university's not guided by or, or helped by this inconsistent data problem. But if you're trying to manage the system from Canberra, that's what's going on here, 
then you're going to really struggle if you don't have consistent, reliable data. So it's beholden upon you to lead this debate and to say, okay, well, we now agreed upon the sorts of metrics we'd be expecting to see in the, you know, the equivalent of these plans. Thank you. Ian, you have a question. Ah, Eve. Thank you. Um, firstly, just a comment. I think, you know, Andrew, your model for how we assign funding to, I suppose, different experiences and student backgrounds is really interesting. And I think it's the first time I've heard someone articulate the fact that I suppose we, we're allocating this money to those sorts of experiences for different reasons. Um, and I think the risk that we that, that is posed by considering all of these as kind of equity groups is actually the reason why there are barriers to those different experiences coming into universities are very, very wildly different. And we're trying to correct for different kinds of marginalisation there. So the model you propose is really interesting and I hope that we can continue to have conversations about how to do that in a way that really works because we're not going to get more than one shot at getting that right um, if history serves. But um, we've spoken a lot about the, the needs-based funding and I'm interested in how, um, you know, where you see the funding coming from for some of the other recommendations that are a little less specific, things like improving teaching and learning quality. Um, what that means practically is, you know, a casual sessional staff who are already relatively underpaid and under-resourced doing more work um, you know, finding ways to upskill. Where does the money come from for that upskilling? Where does the time come from? What qualifications do they do? I, I guess there's just, I, unless I'm missing something, there seems to be a big resourcing void around some of those more general recommendations. And I'm interested to hear what you each think about where that comes from and at, at the cost of what else, I suppose. I guess one of the yeah. dangers here is that in order to be a casual teacher, you'll have to do a self-funded fee help graduate certificate in higher education teaching, which of course will probably cost you more than you'll ever earn uh, as a casual teacher. So it's not worth doing and you just don't do that job. So I think this could have some very unintended consequences and whether the kind of the potentially marginal value of the grad certificate in your teaching quality you know, it really justifies either the cost to the teacher or the, the loss of the potential academic workforce. Well, um, so the centre that I might, um, me and some colleagues did some work for the Accord on teaching quality and educational quality. Um, and I think you're right. I think there's a really important discussion that needs to be had about what is a, uh, an efficient and effective way to upskill the workforce. And I think that that should be a priority for all of us, but I am at a teaching and learning focus centre. Um, I think the, the flip side, and the other thing I'd add to that is on casual and short-term contract staff, you know, many people will be aware that there is um, a significant national discussion going on about that. There's lots of changes to legislation. Um, it's something that we haven't had a chance to talk in you know, this context or indeed in the context of the Accord, but I suspect that there will be large changes to academic workforces um, and that university managers are being forced and, you know, there's often goodwill there as well to think about how they can do things better. But these things are not, and this is where I'm going with this, um, you can't untie a lot of this, right? Quality experience, you know, student success um, cannot be untied from the educational experience, um, from questions. We talked yesterday and earlier today about belonging. That's something that um, maybe we could have a, 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 a more significant discussion about how we support belonging for all students, especially in their first year, right? Um, yes, it's going to cost money, but if we are going to invest in quality education, this is probably where I would personally start. We are, are you happy to take one more question, Ian? Paul? Oh, okay. Mm, sorry. Final question to make. Sorry. My, my question follows on from that excellent one, actually, and that is, it's kind of the elephant in the room, I think. We talk about funding for such important aspects as this, but it's all additive. Um, and yet we do have strains on things like casualisation and so on. What I'm not hearing a lot of is how we extract some of the woeful inefficiencies out of our sector. And I, you hear that in conversations, husk conversations. You don't hear that raised to a point where we actually start to tackle it. And what is it that's going to actually force hmm. us to deal with that? Because if we can get rid of those inefficiencies, and guess what? That's hmm. going to release some resources to apply to the things that are really, really important. Yeah, excellent question. Thank you for that, Shamit. Well, I mean, it's helpful that, that the whole pricing authority has been written into the future. 
because we should make some progress on what it costs to run a university and disaggregate it by particular activities and then maybe link it to outcomes. So the, so the direction of travel is good, it supports that. And then within that, if again you're running a university, it must be in your inbox, your, in your court to work out um, are we running expensive <coughs> things which have very little value in terms of um, academic or educational sort of positivity and then the larger question about people students being sort of, you know, welcome and belonging and rooted on that campus, as well as saying there's an interaction between the two. But Evie's question also makes me think of the fact that she was saying on this panel a, an hour or two ago about, you know, the example about, can't we just streamline this? You know, mm -hmm. there's a 47-page mm -hmm. memo mm -hmm. versus a 20-minute solution. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're at university, you might want to take a look at that. Mm -hmm. There's quite a big incentive, mm -hmm. because that 47-page memo or step, which you described, sounds horrific. Apart from it being horrific for the student, it's a huge cost for the university. It's a misplaced resource. So there, there is a potential to set off a kind of streamlining efficiency um, sort of, you know, uh, momentum here yeah. to solve that kind of pr problem. Yeah. Um, we are running out of time. And um, there's some really great questions online still um, that just illustrate, you know, how complex the problem is. What about asylum seeker and refugee students? What about students in research degrees? You know, like this is not an easy, um, an easy problem to fix. But what I do want to ask, my final question to the panel is, the minister was very clear yesterday that, you know, like the accord roadmap cannot be addressed in just one budget. You know, there'll be several budgets and he talked about several parliaments, you know, to bring this about. So in the panel's view and your one minute answer, what should be in next year's budget? Gwil. Um, there's obviously a big agenda, but I think I would probably start with um, student support right, and youth allowance. It's going to be a big cost, but I think that's a good baseline. Um, and I think we need to think very carefully about what needs-based funding is going to look like to make sure that we don't spread it too thinly. Thank you. Andrew? I'd agree with student government support because there's real evidence that does improve completions. Mm -hmm. I think the one upside for the budget is I don't think demand is going to be as high as they think, and therefore that element won't be as expensive as they might imagine over the next few years. Terrific. Trish? Um, I agree that student support is the the biggest bang for the buck. Um, it's delusional to think that just fee subsidy is going to work. We have to look at living support. And if I could just say one last thing, it's about culture change in teaching. Um, everybody should teach in a university. A teaching, you know, I can't be, some people say, oh, should I, do I have to teach? And I said, well, when I walked in this morning, it did say school on. Um, so, um, you know, how do we really get start to flip from really valuing teaching, learning and the student experience really doing it? And that means everybody should do it. Thank you so much for that. So, so I agree with all that, but I, I would pick out one thing, which is if this managed growth thing is there, I'd like to see the first down payment on the first tranche of that in the first budget year, because it's just breaking it down, you know? So if we're going to double, you can work out the first year in terms of Commonwealth supported places. Yep. That'd be an assurance that it's, you know, a direction of travel we're going to be going on in that direction. Yeah. And where do we set our aspiration, right? Can I just say, you know, just a <laughs> legitimate question to Andrew. You know, if the demand is not there, you know, it really fuels the naysayers to say, well, see, these people don't really want to go. This is not worthwhile. So I just mm. think we... These are another unintended consequences. You know, it might take a while to catalyse uh, this this movement. So, mm -hmm. just thinking, what what are the risks? Look, I think we do have a, a larger school leaver demographic cohort coming through, which will push demand up. Yeah. But we have the the lower year twelve completion that was discussed yesterday, and I think the mature age demand is likely to stay low. Partly because so many more people got their degrees straight after school in the demand-driven mm. era mm. means there are fewer 20 and 30-somethings who are still wanting to get their first qualification. Terrific. Thank you so much um, for, for this really diverse panel and um, for some really um, insightful contributions. Um, there is also the implementation group of the, of the Accord Review, so go lobby, you know, like for what you think should be in next year's budget and in the Accord Roadmap going forward. Thank you so much, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>